Fresh from the beach while playing a round of speed chess with death, it's the IGN Digigods. And now, please welcome two guys who prefer their seventh sign from their seventh seal, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. I love me a good Ingmar Bergman reference, Corey. Someone knows me. Someone knows my heart. Someone knows my soul. Which one of our listeners knows my soul? That gem was mined up by Mario Mendez. Mario, you rock. And that still, was great. And, and Mario, of course, his brother Mike Mendez did uh, Big Ass Spider, which we are still fans of and still pulling for. Yes, we are. Keep watching it. I hope a sequel's in the way. So, uh... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't know. I got no stories this week. Then, then, then you know what? Instead of spending ten minutes talking about some <laughs> stupid story, like last week I had the whole thing about uh, League of Their Own. Yeah. That's over now. We're going to get right to DVDs. I have, a, I have a child. Right to DVDs. Who is walking a lot now. Okay, uh, is, okay, okay. Let me, but before you yes. say that, what I'm saying is we don't need a story to start the show. So if you feel like you have to tell a story about your daughter because we start the show with a story, No, I'm just you, you saying. That's, that's why I have no stories. I'm, I'm literally chasing a child around Fine. all day long who's, who's just walking. That's and who not likes a story. To, you know, by the way, you know, all, those, all that stuff that says keep out of reach of children? Yes. We don't. Are you we know, bad people? Huh? Are we bad people? Because no, every time no. I turn around, she's got she's got like like drain cleaner in one hand and some and like a firearm in the other. And well, I, actually, I, I'm, I feel I'm su- like a bad parent. I'm actually surprised, but she's learning how to use them. I'm surprised because you are a helicopter parent. Kind of, yeah. That kid is going to have some serious separation anxiety <laughs> when she gets older, and it's funny now, but. That's how serial killer uh, starts. Serial killer <laughs> starts because they're too close to mommy and daddy. There are no female serial killers. Yeah, okay, there's, yeah. there's one very famous one. There is? Elaine Warnoff. I mean, yeah. movie about her. Charlene Starr won an Oscar Wait, for it. Monster. You mean, you mean the, 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 the actress who's in all of those old, like, uh, Paul Bartel movies? <laughs> exactly. Well, that's Mary Warnoff. Never mind. Aww. That was a really obscure joke. How dare you. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm going to start off uh, just rolling through some uh, foreign language films. How about that, Mark? I, 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 like, I like the cut of your jib. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you like the cut of my jib. <laughs> All that, right. What fine. does that even mean? I don't know. What no is idea. a jib? And, 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 a, jib and, is a, a jib is a sail in sailing. It's the front sail. It's the, really? Yeah. I didn't expect you to know that. And yet yeah. here we are. Pull in the main sheet, let out the jib sheet. Pull oh. in the jib sheet, let out the main sheet. That's what, that's what I remember from sailing. I remember that. That's how you tack. Didn't know that. You, know, you didn't know that, did you? Okay. F- first off, from First Run Features is a, uh, a French film that I'm a huge fan of. I'm really upset that this didn't get uh, a theatrical release. I thought First Run probably should have at least tried to put this out in theaters for a little while because it's an awful lot of fun. Uh, it's called What's in a Name? And it is, uh, this is from, by uh, filmmakers uh, Mathieu Delaporte and Alexandre de la Paratière. Or Pat- whoa, whoa, with the Frenchy French. Alexandre de la Patelière. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. actual original name of this is the pre- le, le prénom, the first name. Uh, but the English title is uh, What's in a Name? And uh, it's terrific. It is a really cool comedy. Uh, this uh, won a couple of César Awards. Uh, I believe it was a play originally, a stage play, which would make sense because it all takes place during a dinner party in one apartment. And uh, it, is, it is pretty fantastically great. The idea, Patrick Bruhl, who uh, is, is not hugely a name here, but he's an enormous star in France, um, is the guy who shows up to this dinner party, also attended by Valerie uh, Benguigi and Charles Berling and uh, Judith Elzine. Anyway, he, uh, he shows up and um, uh, he's, uh, he's expecting a child. And, and the big question is, what are you going to name your son? Wade, I'm, che- I'm checking... Please, don't look at me. I'm checking my eHarmony account. Uh, okay. I really fine. am, by the way. Very good. Because you could talk about that crap for five minutes, and I'm not going to care, so, so I'm on eHarmony right now. So there he is at, there he is at the dinner party. I with, like this girl. With, 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 this girl looks a little a- Asian. I like Asian girls. I'm a Jew. Jews like Asian girls. So I'm emailing this Asian girl? That has nothing to do with this story. No, I'm okay. just saying. This is what, right. honestly, truly what I'm doing right now. Okay, that's great. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so there he is with, at, at this dinner party. Get thrown basically by his brother-in-law and his sister, and the question is, you know, what are you going to name your son? I will give you nothing else. But they work that tension so brilliantly that when it finally comes up, what what he intends to name his son, there's some wonderful twists and turns. This thing is hysterical. It is a straight-up riot, and even if you don't speak French, you are just going to die laughing. It is so unbelievably clever and funny and, and just charming. 
Speaking and of die laughing, can someone tell me when the OSS films will be out on Blu-ray? I've, I've got them on Blu-ray. On region free? Mm, yes, actually. But is it, are there English subtitles? Yes. There are? Yes. <gasps> will, will they ever come out in, in the U.S.? Uh, you should just order them from like Amazon.fr or something. That's what you should do. Seriously. Mm, I want to do that. Those, those, those movies are so... Yeah. But the problem with they Amazon are. FR is that it's in French. Their region is OSS117. It's the same thing in French. Yeah, but how am I going to like pay for it and, and log in and that kind of stuff? Uh, just You can do it in English. It'll, it'll work for you. Uh, <laughs> you seriously. Like made that up. Uh, Maybe no, it'll work for me. Uh, whatever. Umberto Lenzi, uh, Italian director of the uh, 60s and 70s and thereabouts, um, directed uh, Gang War in Milan in 1973, which is, you know what it's about? Gang War in Milan? It's about a gang war in Milan. You're wrong. See, that's what? what's ironic about the title. Even though it's called Gang War in Milan, it's all in French. Words, it's yes. about it's about it's a, it's the story of fairies and uh, and in a fairyland. So it's a gang war in San Francisco. No, it's about a gang war in Milan. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it's like a, pretty much there were a ton of these Italian movies made in the seventies, and they're all pretty much the same. All these Italian gangster movies from the seventies, terrible sound, uh, but uh, they they got a certain kind of kind of almost giallo vibe to them. And uh, this one's a better script than, than the average. A few twists and turns in it that actually surprisingly kept me going. I didn't want to turn it off after half an hour. So that said, uh, this is from Raro Video, which is distributed by uh, Kino, and it's on Blu-ray. And uh, I, I, I think that one is better than, than most. Uh, also better than most, uh, even better than that, is the Blu-ray also from Raro Video of uh, Duccio Tessari's La Morta Risala alla Lera Sera. Did you like that? That's my Italian. Uh, I mean that is the I'm most Italian I've ever spoken in my uh, I mean life. I'm like another Asian girl on eHarmony. La morte risale alla lera, lera sera. It means death occurred last night. Duccio Tessari. I've never seen a movie by Duccio Tessari. I've never heard of Duccio Tessari. Uh, but this one is, uh, is a murder mystery, basically, that borrows even more extensively from Giallo. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's really, really pretty sharply written. It's a little bit of, a, of an exploitation film. There's a whole kind of uh, um, sex, sex slave angle to it. But it is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good, solid script, much better than the average from that time. Uh, the Golden Bear at the uh, Berlin Film Festival uh, f last year, I think it was, went to Child's Pose, which was a Romanian film that uh, is better than most Romanian films. I, I have a problem with a lot of Romanian cinema of late. Mark knows this. Uh, there are some, oh, it's so some, good. There are some that I really love, like, like 432. I think 432 is fantastic. I think it's an outstanding film. But then there are others like, like, Police Adjective? like Lazarescu and Police Adjective where I, I truly I want to grab a, an axe and just start murdering every human being around me. I just get so angry. Do you know who's it's Just so pointing closer? a camera at, at like the most mundane thing and, and having it just sit there and transpire for 90 minutes does not it doesn't mean like, oh, it's so artistic no it's not do you know it's who has a dull do you know who has a wordless supporting role in Snowpiercer uh, Vla Vlad Ivanov oh, Vlad, whatever. really the guy from uh, the guy wordless. who we gave the best supporting he, actor award to Lefka for 432 the abortionist he's great. yeah he's great he's in uh, Snowpiercer yeah in fact if, if, if he were not the guy reading the frickin' phone book in Police Adjective, I would have murdered someone. And, and, the only and by thing, the way... The only thing that makes that scene less than insufferable is the fact that he's the one reading the phone book. But the fact is, he's still reading the phone book. And you, you, you waited like two hours and 15 minutes for that scene. That was, that was like the ultimate moment of the film. Oh, my gosh. You love this it. is so stupid. Or it's a dictionary. Whatever the hell he's reading, it's a phone book. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, this is Child's Pose, Romanian film. Uh, and the only thing that really uh, makes this thing work is the fact that it has Luminita Georgiou, who we gave an award to at Lafka as well, because she's the ambulance driver in, uh, in Lazarescu. And she's really good in this thing. She is really good. But uh, i, I got to say, the rest of it, I'm a, little bit, uh, I'm a little bit iffy on. The idea is basically that she's, uh, she's, a, her, she's a woman whose son... Uh, has been involved in an auto accident, and she is determined to n not let him go to jail. And it's uh, it's a it's pretty dark. It's pretty slow, but uh, her performance keeps the thing going. So even when the even when you kind of go, does this even scripted? Do they just kind of make this up as they went along? You stick with it because she's really good and she's an amazingly intense actress. So. Uh, that being said, I, uh, this is from Zeitgeist, so that gets a kind of marginal recommendation. It's, I don't hate it. I don't love it like I love 432, but I don't hate it like I've hated most Romanian movies lately. 
So last year, the uh, Australian submission in the foreign language category was a movie called The Rocket. They, of course, did not get a nomination. And we were sent uh, at least 17 different copies of this thing in the mail. Mark, you remember that, right? You like Every day you open up the mail and you're like, another copy? With yes, the, the with more the... copies they send me, the less likely I am to watch the movie. They just would not stop sending us copies of this. Anyway, uh, they sent us a ton of copies. It's a good film. Uh, I don't know if it's a great film, but it takes place in Laos. And it, uh, I assume the language is Laotian or Lao or whatever they, whatever they, they, they speak in, in Laos. It sounds like every other Southeast Asian language to me. So I'm, I'm, I am not skilled at understanding the differences between them. I, I'm fam- somewhat familiar with Cambodia, and that's about the only one. Uh, and Vietnamese, obviously, from you know, uh, love you long time. I know that that's Vietnamese, right? Yeah, yes, it is. From from Full Metal Jacket, absolutely. Anyway, no, uh, this is a, this is a, a pretty great little uh, coming of age story set in Laos, and uh, I, it doesn't really transcend uh, coming of age films that take place in any other store, any, any in any other country. But uh, it's very sweet. It's very well acted, um, and this this kid in particular, the little ten year old uh, in the in the film, whose name I'm going to mutilate right now, uh, Sitafon Dissimo, Joe. Can I call him Joe? Uh, it's not as bad as a Thai name, but man, it, it, those it, it gets tough. Anyway, he is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So, um, good film. Not sure it would have it would have deserved an uh, Oscar nomination, but it's it is a solid film. And then we've got the Jewish Cardinal, which is the true story of Jean Marie Lustiger or Lust, Lustiger. Uh, this is a, a, really an extraordinary story, and this is from um, uh, film movement. And uh, Film Movement has rarely gotten a better film than this. I'm surprised this thing didn't get a theatrical release. This, like 10, 15 years ago, this would have been in theaters in a heartbeat, and it would have done really, really well. Like Weinstein's would have done this. Anyway, uh, Jean-Marie Lustiger was, a, uh, was a really ex- an extraordinary figure. He, he literally was a cardinal, and, but he, because he was born Jewish, he somehow managed to uh, you know, sort of maintain this dual identity and uh, he became Archbishop of Paris uh, under Pope John Paul II and uh, somehow you know he, he was able to um, he, you know this, this created all kinds of friction in his life obviously but it's, it's really an extraordinary story about how that facilitated all of these new relationships and these interesting things that he became involved with and I won't, I won't give any of it away but it's a, it's a really 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 good story so the Jewish Cardinal uh, the true story of Jean-Marie Lustiger um, directed by um, Ilan Duran Cohen there's a, Jew. Name, there's a name I'm not going to destroy no, guy I'm not familiar with, Elon Duran Cohen. I'm, uh, look, I'm Jewish. I don't know who he is. He's he's a member of the tribe. Well, anyway, and you know, uh, Pakistan is in the, is in the news again lately. And uh, after I watched this, and not in a good way, did you hear what happened in Pakistan? You hear the story that this woman, the pregnant woman. Was that the one who they tried to stone to death? No, they did stone her to death. Oh, they did. It's absolutely most infuriating thing. Her, this, but this took place in Lahore. This isn't in like some you know dusty tribal community where they where they barely have running water and open sewers. This is in Lahore, which is a major cosmopolitan city in Pakistan. Normally, Pakistan, you're like if you want to find the crazies, you got to go way north. It's like going out into the boonies. If you're in the city, yeah, you got internet, and, you know, you got cafes, and it's all, it's like no, this is in Lahore. This is in a city. Uh, this woman had married a, a widower. And um, uh, they had, you know, she was expecting a child. She was three months pregnant. Her father was furious. She had like dishonored the family by not marrying the cousin that her father had selected for her to marry. And literally, they filed a complaint against her husband, claiming he had abducted her. Now you got you got to wonder with the Pakistani police. It's like you, why don't you just talk to her? And if she says, no, that's BS, my dad's like pulling one out of his unit, uh, they would have let it go. But instead, this thing actually was made it to court. She was going up the steps to the courthouse to testify that that was not true when her brother stepped in front of her, pumped two bullets into her chest, and then her dad clobbered her on the head with a brick, and then her mom and her other brothers and the rest of the family basically stoned her to death on the, on the, the steps. But here's the thing, though. I mean, and this is insane. It got the family together because they were all involved in an activity. And I think that's a good thing. Oh, man, it's insane. You know anyway. what? You, there's nothing you can do. They're, they're just backwards people who are out of their minds. Anyway, Pakistan has problems. And uh, it is, it's got serious problems. And that's why I'm going to highly recommend, in, especially in the wake of this story, uh, from Virgil Films, uh, Yosh, or Josh, Against the Grain. Um, y- you have to, 
you, you got you just it, it will it's it's not a great film it's not an incredibly well made film but it's it's it gets the message across it's uh it's certainly very very it's powerful and uh it makes you helps you understand exactly what women go through in Pakistan and how the country struggles against these issues that I'm talking about right now and it it all kind of begins with the disappearance of a nanny and uh you know the search for this nanny and what this uh, un- uh, uh, reveals and unveils. And uh, it's, it, again, especially with this story in the news, you, you definitely want to check this out. So that I, I also give highest recommendations to. Um, oh, and one other quick thing before we move on to television, Mark. I want to make mention of this little, uh, this little odd, peculiar gem. Uh, Steven Soderbergh does a lot of good work. Uh, almost, this is almost like he's being a uh, philanthropist when he does stuff like this. Visitors is a Steven Soderbergh Presents thing. And uh, this is from Cinedime, and I, I gotta really tip my hat to Soderbergh because he's just he gets he gets behind really really cool stuff. Um, Godfrey Reggio, uh, who did Koyana Scotzi, you know, doesn't really he's not like Mr. Commercial Filmmaker, but Soderbergh got behind it and and said I'm gonna do a present presentation credit and help you get your next movie made. And so Godfrey Reggio, with Philip Glass again on board, uh, doing the music, uh, did this movie called Visitors. And this actually was theatrically released. Did you it, briefly? Did you did you get a chance to see I this? Did not. Chance? Uh, I did not see it in theatrical release, but it is uh, again a uh, very experimental movie, uh, not exactly in the Koyana Scotsi vein, but it's uh, it's sort of it's like a sideways thing. The whole movie is basically seventy four shots, and they're just portraits. They're just you know pick people and landscapes and animals, and they're just. It's, uh, it's, it's meant to be much, almost the counterpoint to the Koyana Scotsi films. And uh, even though you might think, my gosh, what the, how, how interesting could that be? It, like, it's cool. Somehow you just get into the mode, the, the Philip Glass music, and I'm not usually a Philip Glass fan, and I'm not, certainly not a fan of the Katsi films, but you just kind of let this, it, it, it like washes over you in an almost meditative, ethereal way. It's uh, better than yoga, I'll tell you that. Because, you know, those... Those yoga people, they... Uh, they're all vegans? They're all vegans. <laughs> all right, wait, let's get into TV. We have two interchangeable shows from USA that uh, I just don't understand who watches these shows. It must be on in the background while people vacuum. Must be. We have Suits Season 3, and we have Covert Affairs Season 4. I don't know what these shows are about, but I think they're about very handsome uh, men with short, uh, dirty brown hair and very tall brunettes and possibly blondes. Mm-hmm. That's, and they pretty much do things that are very Ally McBeal-esque. Like everybody talks like yep. they're, everybody talks as if they know they're on a show. Yeah. And they want to be as clever as they can as they speak. Yeah. David, and, e, David E. Kelly is responsible for that. He oh is. God. That's, the, that's the D, David E. Kelly effect. So forget those shows. Come on. Yeah. Seriously. Uh, Warehouse 13, season five. This thing just keeps rolling along. Um, this is all about this warehouse where they store all sorts of, uh, you know, crazy alien-related artifacts and whatnot. And it co-stars Saul Rubinek, who, of course, uh, uh, had a supporting role in a Best Picture Oscar winner. What film was that, Wade? Saul Rubinek. Saul Rubinek. Had a supporting role in a Best Picture Oscar winner. There he is. Saul Rubinek. I mean, I'm trying to think I'm of thinking, all my... I'm thinking he's Jewish. No, I'm trying to think of all the things I've enjoyed. I mean, I enjoyed Saul Rubinek in those episodes of uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. I certainly enjoyed him playing a facsimile of... Uh, of uh, uh, in in uh, true Ram- true romance, where he's basically playing Joel Silver, or uh, yeah, yeah, Joel Silver. But he had a supporting role. It wasn't a huge role. But he had a su- small he, supporting yeah. role in a western that won Best Picture. Really, he was in Unforgiven. Yes, he played the uh, the journalist who's coming to. That's uh, right. That was him. You know what else he played? Uh, he was Bongos? in. He was. He, no, he played. Uh, if you remember, he in Dick. You remember Dick? He played. Yes. Uh, he played uh, Kissinger. He, and he did a great That's Kissinger. Funny. He did a great Kissinger. He's one of those out there kind of actors. Anyway, yeah. um, he's the best thing about Warehouse 13 because at least he's got some funk to him. This is a sci-fi show. Everyone else is, you, you know, very handsome and beautiful and whatever. At least he's got some, mm. a little bit of uh, personality. Mm. Otherwise, I, ne- I never really... I mean, I, I like the idea, I guess, of the show. Sure. Um, also, we have the Jetsons Season 3. Now, the Jetsons Season 3 is... Uh, 
That's what I'm going to talk about next. I'm uh -huh. just giving a little preview. The show, the, well, the Jetsons only lasted uh, for three seasons. So this the Jetsons is, lasted for two seasons, and then they resurrected it like years later in the 80s for this, yeah, this, like, this bogus it. third season. This I is know. It. it. It was like 10 episodes. It was, it was in 1987. This is ridi it's ridiculous. So, it's stupid. Why'd they do that? It was stupid. The animation wasn't as cool. Um, and it doesn't count as a third season. It's it really like, doesn't. It's, it, it's, it's like calling the new Dallas... Oh, you know, 30 years later, we decided to do season 15. It's like, what? No, it's, it's a new series. It's a whole new deal. Okay. Stop for, it. Exactly. So get the first two. Forget this one. O unless you're like a total Jetsons movie. I mean, it's By okay. the way, why have they not done a Jetsons movie? You'd think that they would do a Jetsons movie at some point. They, it was in development for years. This is, it's another one of those things like, uh, you know, like John Carter, right? It just, it's just like you cannot get the pieces together at the studio level, and there's so much money invested in it, and every year they spend more millions and more millions. And A-Team, look, dude, A-Team took like 13 or 14 years to make. Was it worth it? Totally. No, and see, and, and I know three of the writers that were involved. You know at least one of them. Indeed. You know, uh, and and it just they could never get that thing right. No, it, it, it's it's the the Jetsons movie was a, uh, originally a deal, and I think it was 1995 or six when they were first talking about making that, and Chevy Chase was attached. Chevy they played Chase. George Jet, uh, George Jetson, yeah, Chevy Chase. It was going to be Chevy, like Chase, Chevy Chase, and I forget who was going to play Jane. It was like. Valerie Curtin or somebody. Anyway, can't remember. Okay. Anyway, okay. One yeah. last TV thing yeah. you should ignore, which is the fourth season of Pretty Little Liars. This is the ABC Family Show. It's a mystery drama, and uh, it, it starts where the third season leaves off. I mean, I, I couldn't really watch many of these because I mean, it's a bunch of. I mean, they're all hot, but I'm just saying that they're a bunch of four girls who, you know, they're all dealing with uh, you know a murder. One of the cops in the town got murdered, and they got to find out who did it. And uh, I just don't care. You know, they get dressed up in some funny costumes for some of the other ones, for some of the episodes here. But otherwise, uh, this is just not for me. All right. I, I don't think you. it's for all. I don't, I'm not sure how many female listeners we have, but I would imagine that. We got, uh, we got a few. We got a few. Well, then they and may go cool. for it. Because it's and really, cool. it's really, they're, they're cool. But it's really a show for the, uh, for the 20-somethings. Yeah. I am not a 20-something girl. Well, thank goodness, because I'm not sure this show would work if you were. Why not? I don't know. You don't like girls. Okay, a bunch of, uh, bunch of vintage -y stuff. Uh, Perry Mason movie collection. we got some double features here. One, two, and three. And uh, I don't know, man. The Perry, once, they, once they got to these later Perry Mason things, this is basically when they, they decided that uh, there was some value in, in going to Raymond Burr years and years and years after the fact. And, uh, and saying, you remember that show that you, you did like 20 years ago, 30 years ago? How about like being Perry Mason again, except now you're bearded and old and grizzled and gray. And it's better than Ironside because you don't have to sit in a wheelchair. And so anyway, late 80s, they, they, they dug up uh, Raymond Burr and had him do the case of the sinister spirit, the case of the murdered madam, the case of the shooting star, the case of lost love. Perry Mason returns, the case of the notorious nun. And all of this stuff is pretty middling it's like slightly better and grungier matlock but i i, yeah, I don't know if you unless you're just a diehard raymond burr fan it, it gets so old so quickly and they're all basically the same you know raymond the only the only reason that stuff works is because raymond burr has that voice where he can just ask like a cross-examination question and everyone is on the seat of their the, the edge of their seat <laughs> if anyone else the asks edge of their pants the, 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 the edge, edge of their, of their pants. pants I was going to say flying by the seat of their, they're flying by the edge of their seats no what <laughs> uh, mixing my metaphors now he uh, it's just Raymond like if, if you were to say to somebody uh, so where were you at 9am when uh, your wife was cooking eggs in the kitchen it's the most boring question in the world but if Raymond Burr says where were you at 9 a.m. when your wife was cooking egg. Somehow the cadence of his voice, you just hang on every word. Cheesy. It's just the dumbest song. I don't know what it is, but that's the only reason that stuff works. Rawhide, the eighth and final season, is pretty cool. This is, a, this is one of the better seasons of Rawhide, actually. You watch this and you're like, why did it go off the air? Uh, this is completely engaging, and Clint Eastwood is fantastic. He should have been a TV star because he certainly didn't have much of a career in the movies. By the way, are you not looking forward to Jersey Boys like crazy? Clint is, what is he, 86 years old I now? Know. See, I think he thinks, he, his was Clint's he probably, 86? He's just turning 86? Uh, would you like me to check Look it up. Now? Look it up, man. I think Clint Eastwood is thinking to himself, I have to keep directing films or I'll die. Like, I think he thinks that's what's keeping him alive. It could be, because he is on a clip just in the past seven or eight years that is just superhuman. It's like the guy, the guy. He's 84. 84. Man, 
ever since he turned like 75, it's like he hit 75 and he's just he's a spring chicken again. It's incredible. It's so impressive. It's it's like Woody Allen, an, an, another director who does a pretty yeah. much a film a year. He had that line about how you know a, a relationships are or like a shark. Yes. You know when it stops swimming, it dies. Did you have you seen the trailer for Magic in the Moonlight? You liked it? Oh, that looks so awesome. Really? Oh my gosh! Give me a break. Okay. Paris, 1920s. Okay. Emma Stone. Okay. Fine. Colin Firth. Okay, fine. M. Stowe, Kofi. <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> what? Yeah. Together they're they're going to be uh, Calsto or or uh, oh, I'm not bail- M- I'm, I'm not bailing you out. Emfer, <laughs> Emfer. No, that's it. Just looks so much. It looks like so much fun. Could not be better. Anyway, Raw had the final season, thirteen episodes, and uh, the, there's some really good stuff in here. Uh, it, it's only thirteen episodes, so obviously you know things are winding down. But uh, it's it's a it's a still a fun series. So it's too bad. That's all. So we'll probably get like a complete series box set of all. Uh, all eight seasons this uh, for Christmas season. Um, you know, the King family was a big deal in the 1960s. They, they, they all sing, and they're all musical. It's the most enormous freaking family in multi-generations, and uh, they do a lot of TV specials. And uh, these are all of their specials, Volume 1. Ah, you see, the King family classic television specials collection, Volume 1. See, the little volume one is really in tiny print there because they want you to think, oh, really? All of the specials? I love that. And then you realize, oh, no, you couldn't possibly put it on there because there are more specials than there are people in the King family, and the King family is like 970 people big. I mean, they did specials constantly for every imaginable day. It was Mother's Day and, and uh, Christmas and Easter and, uh, you know, uh, Tree Day and Arbor Day and who knows what. It just, it, on and on and on. It was, there was no end to the specials. And... Uh, this is a whole bunch of them, and uh, they're all kind of the same. You're basically not watching this so much for their music as you are to see who pops in. And uh, you get a few interesting people popping in, uh, but it's pretty much strictly if, if you grew up with these things and you have any kind of a nostalgic attachment to it, then you can, uh, then you can sit down for three some odd hours, three and a half, four hours, and, and troll through it. So that's volume one. Don't buy it unless you fully intend on buying the rest when they release them. Stuart Whitman, Simran Strip, the complete series, another western, not as good as uh, as Rawhide, it's not as good as Gunsmoke, not as good as frankly any other western on television, but it wasn't bad. Uh, the, kind of you know the idea of Simran Strip is the uh, the place that separated Kansas from the uh, the outer territories where all the you know the savage the savage natives were restless and waiting to scalp you. Right, so you're right on the edge of civilization there. Kansas was right on the edge, man. I like that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. all right. It's okay. It wasn't as hot, you know. It wasn't as good as all the others, but it was. It had, it had its moments. Anyway, so uh, Stuart Whitman is, of course, a marshal, and uh, not as as hip as Marshall Matt Dillon. He's kind of kind of a little more uh, easygoing. But again, this is all about the guest stars. And uh, when you look at this, when you look at the the guest star list, you're like, holy cow! I know what episode, what era that took place in. Because um, you get Richard Boone and you get David Carradine and Seymour Cassell, who Mark and I have all kinds of stories about. Uh, Marriott Hartley, Victor French, Steve Forrest, Robert Duvall, Denver Pyle, Telly Savalas, Warren Oates, Slim Pickens. You know, it's pretty much it's, it's Tom Skerritt even shows up in here. Young Tom Skerritt, John Voight. Uh, so it just goes on and on and on, and it's and that's and that makes it kind of fun. Um, but uh, I, I will say this, Stuart Whitman, uh, I have a funny Stuart Whitman story. <laughs> when I worked at the, uh, the Man's National Theater, uh, the, the, the old manager that we used to have before he had health problems, he was an old guy. And uh, he, used to, he used to be a real star effer, right? You know, if anybody showed up and wanted to kind of get a you slip in, he'd be like, ah, it's good to see you, how you doing? You can go on. And he'd let him in. Right? He's just an old guy. He's like, oh, you're a movie star. All right, come on in. And he let the movie stars in. And eventually, when we got a new manager, uh, he was a younger guy, and he was like, buy the book. And so Stuart Whitman shows up one day, and he shows up at the door, and the new manager's like, yes, can I help you? And he's like, oh, yeah. I want to see if I can see the movie. He's like, well, there's, there's the box office. <laughs> it was the most awkward. He was like, clearly thinking, oh, they're going to rec- recognize me. And this is like the 80s, and I'm thinking, I'm looking at him, and I'm standing right there, just a measly usher, and I'm just shaking my head, and I'm thinking, bro, I know who you are, because I'm a nerd, and I have no life. 
this guy has no idea who you are. <laughs> Nobody else around here knows who you are. You haven't done anything that anyone has seen in well over 10 years. That is celebrity entitlement, and I don't like it. Anyway, I remember, Stuart Whitman. I remember that was the moment where I was like, oh, Stuart Whitman, you're so sad. It's all over for you. Uh, speaking of sad, we have uh, Ray Donovan, season one with the uh, Blu-ray uh, is now out. It is uh, the Showtime show that uh, I like a lot. Actually, I think this is a little bit underappreciated. This is, um, what's his name, uh, Liv Schreiber, plays a, a fixer in a, a law firm. And his father, who uh, gets out on early parole, has come to uh, put the family back together. I actually think this is a pretty slick show. Yeah. I, I think this is a pretty, I'm, and I'm surprised. It, I'm always amazed at the shows that just sort of, bam, generate like instant heat and sometimes it's good because of the star but sometimes it's not you know like Six Feet Under was instant heat even though there was no one on the show that anybody really recognized but somehow it just <laughs> caught fire same with The Sopranos right uh, nobody on The Sopranos was a star before The Sopranos they were stars afterwards now you know Leif Schreiber is a, a big but this thing hasn't really caught fire but I think it's a slick show it is a good show and uh, you know what and it totally owns what it's about this, this thing is pretty tawdry and uh, I mean less violent than it is pretty in the gutter which yeah. is really kind of cool stuff and um, you know uh, John Boyd is great I mean John Boyd yeah he somehow managed to keep working. I mean, he just keeps working. Yep. You know, he does this and this and that and that, and you yes, got to love sorry. him. And, uh, you know, what can you say? He's great in it, and Liv Schreiber's great in it, and it's a very cool little show. It's it is. a very cool little dark crime thing. Good good and showtime stuff. That's right. Now, uh, not many people are fans of Falling Skies, and I can't say I've seen every episode, but... Uh, I've what, seen enough. It what make, I have it, seen, it, it yeah, gives me a headache. Why? It's aliens, and they're coming down. I know, but it's... Uh, yeah. No, I mean Noah Wiley is is the only decent thing about it. Really. Yeah, but I just, it's you know just, what? It's you know what it is. It's like it's the same problem that I have with The Walking Dead. It's like all right, I get it. Every week I'm going to tune in. Well, you know like, what? The Walking Dead's boring. Oh I think The Walking Dead's boring. It's, they're all like, the same the to me. Walk around. I, I, maybe I understand. I, I know a lot of people love these shows, and I don't mean to denigrate them, but it's like. You know, it's like, okay, if, if the aliens, if you actually defeat the aliens, the show's over. If you actually defeat the zombies, the show's over. So, I, I, it's, you know, there's got to be something else there for me to hang my hat on. And, and for me, at least, there just isn't. Well, Noah Wiley is not my favorite. I like Noah Wiley. Yeah, he's, he's a little lightweight for me. He's not, uh, he's not like the commanding presence that he should be. But uh, I do like the show. I like the aliens. I like the little fights. I did, like, this season, I... Watched an episode where they have to uh, blow up a nuclear plant. That was kind of cool. Yeah. But um, otherwise, it's EP'd by Steven Spielberg, who probably has not seen an episode of this in three years. <laughs> That's probably true. Because he's busy probably doing other things. True. But uh, it's really not a bad show. Okay. We have uh, Workaholics is the Comedy Central show that, uh, you know, it's got very mixed reviews. Uh, it's got a couple laughs. It's like Office Space, but yet not as... It's not as clever and uh, satirical as Office Space. This is pretty much on-the-nose comedy that either you like or don't like. And uh, there you go. It's on Blu-ray and includes a bunch of uh, uncensored stuff and uh, deleted and alternative scenes. But I would, uh, look, if you're like a worker bee hanging out at Kinko's trying to make ends meet for 40 hours a week, you might kind of dig workaholics. Otherwise, I just don't find this stuff all that funny. It's a little too on-the-nose for me. Yes, Wade? You keep going. I'm just laughing at the next thing that I'm going to talk about. Talk about talking because about? Just, you'll see. <laughs> um, uh, you talk about what you're going to talk about, then I'll talk about what I'm going to talk about. Because <laughs> okay. I want to know what you're laughing at. Okay, so I want you to name right now the all of William Shatner's iconic roles. Name for me the iconic roles that you can think of William Shatner just right off the bat. Uh, well, obviously Star Trek, yeah. uh, the P- Boston Public Guy, Boston Legal, Legal, but Denny Crane, right? Denny William, Crane. William, like you know, you don't even need to say the names of the shows. You know the characters. T.J. Cap- Hooker. T.J. Hooker. No, 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 no. James T. Kirk. Captain, no, no, Denny no. Crane. No, 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 no. What? Uh, Commander Murdoch. Commander I think that was his name. Hang on, checking. What about Jeff Cable? Right? Jeff Cable. Right? Right? Jeff Cable? No, I'm no? looking. Try, I'm trying to. I believe that Shatner's character's name in Airplane 2, yeah. which had one of the great sight gags of all time, which Shatner was, uh, was Shatner's gag. Sure. I believe his uh, character's name was um, Buck Murdoch. Buck Murdoch. But, but of all of his great characters, you've got to like Jeff Cable the most, right? Jeff Cable? Uh, you know Jeff Cable? Uh, I, I do not. Jeff Cable and Cash Conover? <laughs> no? I don't know what you're talking about. And Moose Moran? No. M- Moose Moran? M- you don't, really? You don't know this? You're not familiar with this series? <laughs> Barbary Coast. I know Barbary <laughs> Coast. I haven't thought about it in years. 
you know, I remember Barbary Coast. I do too. It died. It was like it ran for 13 episodes and was over. It pretty much was like, you know what? People, people watching television are like, William Shatner, you are Captain Kirk. You are not a cowboy. I'm not really buying this. And uh, Doug McClure was kind of a joke at the time. No, <laughs> this is the silliest show. So the idea here is that they, they, they were sort of going for a uh, Wild Wild West kind of vibe with William Shatner and Doug McClure, who obviously are not at all to people who should be showing up in a Western. They're certainly not, you know, uh, Robert Conrad and Ross Martin. So anyway, um, it, 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 and, and there was supposed to be, I think, a, maybe a little bit of a, uh, a Mission Impossible vibe to it as well. Anyway, so uh, these two guys, you know, he's, he's like a government agent, William Shatner is, and basically the, the James T. West kind of character. A little bit of a, of a Artemis Gordon thing because he's a disguised guy as well. But... Um, it, it just doesn't work. Thirteen episodes in, it just it didn't work. And Richard Keel plays Moose Moran in it. So that's uh, anyway. This is from Acorn, and I find this interesting because this was. If you look at the way that this was put together, Acorn normally releases uh, stuff that is either Canadian or Australian or British. They 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 you know they they license stuff that is basically branded through uh, British distributors. So this is from Acorn via CBS and I'm like well CBS normally their, their libraries go out through Paramount so I, that is, for some reason somebody approached CBS and said would you be willing to let us license this and they're like sure because we got no interest in it that's my guess anyway Barbary Coast complete series with William Shatner and Doug McClure on four discs it is kind of kind of a silly hoot it's, it's, it's kitsch more than it is good uh, True Blood the complete sixth season from HBO uh, once again, uh, leading into the final season, which is starting up in uh, just a matter of days, I believe. And uh, this is a Blu-ray set. True Blood, never one of my favorite shows. Uh, I've seen it intermittently. Uh, I, you know, whenever we get a Blu-ray, I'll, I'll kind of try to see if I can catch up with what's going on. And I, you know, it's a, it's just not my vibe. But um, Alan Ball really kind of nailed it with this and got uh, he, he elevated his cachet and. You know, I mean, Alan Ball was already a bit of a big deal because of American Beauty and a few other things, but this really kind of made him, it made him a TV showrunner. I, I think this show is done. I'm it, over it. Well, it is. It's, it's one more season. They're, they're finished, but it really upped his, his, his cred, his street cred in Hollywood in a way that I never expected to. It's a freaking vampire thing, you know? Uh, who would have who'd thunk? But anyway, so here it is, the, uh, the sixth season leading into the seventh season, which will be the last one, and, uh, you know, a lot of people really... Uh, paid for their boats and their mansions with this thing, namely Anna Paquin, who I don't think had much of a career doing anything. And by the way, Anna Paquin shows up in, in the new X-Men film for how many nanoseconds? How many frames? Well, she shot more, but it was all taken out. Yeah, I know. I'm sure it'll be in the blue. But she's in the film for one like shot. one shot. It's like well, literally, literally, I kid you not, one shot at the end. It's insane. When you realize that the world is destroyed because the X-Men Halle failed. Barry, Barry worked for what? A day and a half? Yeah, that, that, that her character was nothing. It's she, crazy. She's, no. I mean, here's the thing. There's, the movie essentially, X-Men, Days of Future Past, which yeah. I think is terrific, it's essentially two full casts. Yeah. And you can't service them all. Yeah, but, but I mean, and, and yeah, and, and a lot of people just worked very, very sparsely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Meet the Robertsons, a look at the scene, a behind the scenes look at America's favorite family. I'm not so sure they're America's favorite family anymore. Ratings plummeted after, uh, after you know, the dad Robertson kind of ran his mouth. Um, anyway, this is from Echo Bridge, and uh, this is, of course, you know, the, uh, the Duck Dynasty people. And uh, it goes a little bit behind the scenes, but it's not entirely behind the scenes. So this is, uh, this is actually kind of a marketing thing. This really should be an extra on one of the, uh, on one of the A&E titles, but it's not. So if you're a huge admirer of them, I guess you'll probably want to pick it up, but it's, it's not an essential. Uh, the complete first season of Resurrection, uh, of course, leading into uh, a second season. I would presume, and uh, this is another one of those. This is another one of those lost type shows that just tries to ask more questions than it should without giving you any answers. And uh, I'm I'm not really on board with this. Uh, I thought that the I thought the trailers were interesting. All the lead-ins I thought were interesting, but I was like, you're going to have to start giving me something here. This has to be more than just a great big giant mystery that we're going to stretch out over eight years without actually resolving anything, and then kind of try to piecemeal it together at the end. Uh, the, the lost gimmick is, is done with. 
And uh, I gotta be honest, it kind of feels like that's exactly what they're doing. So all these people start coming back. Everybody starts, you know, they kind of start to come to life again. Eh, you know what, the characters have to be more interesting and the scenarios need to start paying off. That said, a couple of interesting featurettes, one of them about shooting in Georgia, some bloopers and deleted scenes. We'll see where that one goes. And then, Mark, this show uh, on HBO, True Detective. Um, I'm, uh, you know, Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson are the stars, but neither one of them plays Trudy. So who's Trudy on this show? Uh, I, I don't know. However, I will say this. Um, I don't have HBO, so I didn't uh, see yeah. the show, and the, and the Blu-ray was sent to you, Yeah. which means that you have to not only talk about it, yes. but then you have to lend that to me so I can watch it. <laughs> okay. Will you lend that to me, please? And don't sure, say your wife wants sure. it. Sure, Christy wants to watch it. No. She doesn't want to watch it. No, no, we don't have time to watch it. Thank like, you. Just we, lend we that have to, to me. No, we, seriously. That's, Thank you. We got you a baby. lend that to me. We got a baby. I sit around. I sit around. She doesn't watch anything. I sit around at night watching this stuff at like 2 in the morning. Thank you. You are lending that to me. Yes. Just say yes, because I want to know. Yes, I want on the recording that you said yes, you would lend that to me. Yes. Like when we're done, you'll lend that to yes. me. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so anyway, this is True Detective. Uh, I'm not, still not sure who plays Trudy, but uh, Matthew McConaughey, Woody Harrelson. Uh, I'm going to keep working that joke until it pays off. It won't, believe me. Anyway, this is, uh, this is a huge, huge new hit for HBO. And, uh, well, we, they're going to recast it. Uh, they're recasting, which I think is kind of genius, to be honest. Supposedly they, they, they had made an offer to Jessica Chastain. Yeah. And I'm not sure what happened with that, but... I don't, think I don't think she'll do that. I'd be, they'd have to give her an awful lot of money. She's got to watch out. She's because uh, there was a lot of heat on her for for you know a couple of years. Yeah. You know after she did like you know eight movies within like you know two years span, but they all got released in the same like six or nine well, months. You, she's she's got to keep. She's got to. She can't lose momentum. You can tell that Matthew McConaughey is still working on putting his weight back <laughs> from from working on uh, Dallas Buyers Club on this. But it's a it's it is a good show. It is a it is a very good show. And uh, the, the whole murder mystery angle of it, it's very dark. It's very HBO. Very smart to cast a couple of really solid actors who've never worked together before and who really just bring the whole, you know, Louisiana Bayou ickiness to the, to the proceedings. It's really sharp. Very well done. Beautifully directed. Uh, just really sharp all the way, quality all the way through. And uh, it's... it's actually a, this actually happened in 1995 so there is you know this is uh there there's apparently like an actual there's actual real life stuff backing this up so uh anyway it's all it's just a beautiful show it's really really solid and uh the next series will be really interesting to see how that works with that recasting so anyway this is a true detective which there's also a there's also an issue now with the Emmys, whether or not this should be in competition as a miniseries or a series, right? Isn't that the... It's, it's a series. It's a, but, was a series? Yeah, but, they're, but they submitted it in the miniseries category. Well, because it's probably less competition. Which is, which is what happened. Don't happen put that down. Give that to me. Okay, fine. Because you're going to forget. All right. Carry on. You're not giving this to me. You are Car lending this to me. Carry on, James. Uh, you, you only, well, all all Carry I'm on, talking James. about is uh, Klondike. Now, okay. Uh, Discovery is getting into the um, scripted uh, drama oh, business. Oh, heaven help us. And they did it with a show called... Um, uh, Klondike, which was mm -hmm. uh, produced by uh, Ridley Scott, so it looks great. It is it's a pretty much the live action version of all those Discovery reality shows, where it's like you know tough men with a job to do, and they're all like grizzled and living in like you know eight, like eighteen nineties prospector land, and uh, it's pretty much just the live action scripted version of their reality shows. But I, I have to say, there's no heat on the show. Uh, Nobody cares about it. No one's talking about it. But it's actually not that bad. It's got some spectacular scenery, good performances. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty dramatic. Lots of good character conflict. I think it's actually pretty good. Um, it's just going nowhere. That's the only problem with this show. It's got Tim Roth, Sam Shepard, Abby Cornish. So it's got like an actual cast. So I don't know what the deal is with the show. In fact, I wish they would have come out with it on Blu-ray, not um, DVD, because the... Uh, because the Canadian wilderness looks so beautiful in it. But uh, that's all we have of Klondike, EP'd by Ridley Scott. So check it out. You never know. Nice. Go. All right. And then uh, last on our television list, uh, I got a couple of uh, foreign titles from uh, MHZ, uh, their international mystery line. MHZ, of course, megahertz doing some just, they, they, they're going overseas and they're finding really, really cool stuff. We got a couple of Scandinavian uh, killers here. The uh, one is Henning Mankel's Wallander 3, or Wallander, and uh, starring Christer Hendrickson. You know, Wallander, we've all seen the British version of, and uh, this is the th uh, third series. 
uh, of the original uh, Swedish version, and it's pretty fantastic. Uh, just much more intense and much darker, and really a great performance by Hendrix, and he's just... He's just so grizzled, and uh, this is one of those guys that you really just, you, you want to put him in a movie. He's just so good. Uh, six episodes here, as is often the case with a lot of European shows. They don't do a lot of episodes, but they really put everything into them. And uh, some really great stuff here, especially uh, episodes five and six are really sharp. Uh, five is The Arsonist, and six is The Man Who Wept, uh, which is a kidnapping story that's really, really good. Very intense, really well done. And then we also have Braun the Bridge, B-R-O-N or B-R-O-E-N. And um, this is a murder mystery done, again, Scandinavian style, really just g- gritty and grungy and uh, uh, in the most, just in a way that you wouldn't expect the Scandinavians to do. Uh, it takes place uh, between Sweden and Denmark, so the whole thing is in Swedish and in Danish. And it's a, a co- you know, how all the police forces from these two coalesce to uh, look at this very unusual murder. And I'll tell you nothing about the murder other than it is incredibly nasty. This is a nasty, ugly, weird, twisted, serial killery type thing that I would normally expect from the Koreans, not the Scandinavians. So uh, anyway, it's pretty intense. Definitely worth watching. If you're into this kind of thing, uh, it'll shock you that this is what they put on television in, uh, in Sweden and Denmark, but it's really, really good. So that is The Bridge, otherwise known as Braun or Braun, depending on whether you speak Danish or, uh, or Swedish. I don't know, but I, I do own a Braun electric razor, and that's important. Um, anyway, I don't know so where that came from. Okay, go on. I don't know either. So now it's time for the yearly um, Liam Neeson action thriller. <sighs> Liam Neeson, who's like 60 years old, has uh, reinvented himself as an action hero. And the thing is, he's only done one good film in that whole action realm thing. I mean, Taken, Taken was fantastic. The rest are all crap. <laughs> Although some people like the wolf thing. I lo- Oh, you know what? Okay, here's the thing. I love The Grey. That is a great movie. But I don't consider... That is that is a little above stuff like Nonstop and Taken 2 and the other stuff. I love okay. The Grey. I would consider that... A, that's not even part of this discussion. Okay. okay I think the film's great. Okay. But we, here we have Nonstop, which, um, other than having a really cool title, and I'm very surprised that no one's ever co-opted that title for a film before. Um, you know, I don't know what to say. It's, 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 it's just a... The only thing that keeps this from being just a B-movie programmer is the yeah. fact that it's cut pretty well. It's got a very brisk pace. Liam Neeson is, you know, Liam Neeson. Right. And, uh, you know, there are bits of fun to it. Uh, otherwise, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's just... It's, just, it's kind of weak sauce in certain areas, but... Uh, you know, it moves fast. It's it's kind of fun. It's Liam Neeson. If it's Saturday night, order up a pizza, rent nonstop. Uh, you know, I don't know what to say. You can do a lot worse. Um, it's just not a great movie, but it's nope. fun for Saturday night. Um, okay, wait. Here's the thing. Now's the time. <laughs> where, here, now's the time where we have uh, our Adam McGoin. I know. I know. We have our Adam McGoin conversation. Uh, where Adam McGoin so did one of my all-time favorite films, Sweet Hereafter. Sweet Hereafter, one of mine too. Unbelievable. Look, that was a great streak. Mind there. bending. Look, from Exotica to Sweet Hereafter to Felicia's Journey, there's like a moment there, and you're like, this guy is. He's, he is, the, he's, he's the shizzle. Been, he's the shizzle. He is it. He is on track. He's going to win a Palme d'Or. He's going to win an Oscar. He's going to just make a masterpiece. It's over. He's just going to. And then suddenly, he just turned around like, and he, it's like he gave himself a lobotomy, and he just said, "I'm going to make poop now." And then it was over. It was. It ended. It and the thing crap. Is, it's been crap ever since. What happened? And the thing is that Devil's Knot, which we're talking about now, Devil's Knot. It, 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 it's that same territory, which is that you know, murdered kids. Yeah. The Sweet Hereafter was about the death of a child, and My Devil's Knot is the same thing. It's about the death. It's about the death of uh, of, of um, these young boys uh, playing in the woods. There's this rush to convict the killers, so it's very topical. Got a lot of juice there, and it's got a good cast: Colin Firth, Oscar winner; Reese Witherspoon, Oscar winner. But um, what happened? <laughs> It was like a moment. There were these amazing movies, and then he just... He just and it was over. It just it doesn't make wow. any sense. I just, you know it's what? like a body snatcher came in, and he just became someone else. You know what it is? That there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of sense of just, like, powerful storytelling anymore, you know? And it, it, it eventually... It, but it, the it West evolved. Memphis 3, the West Memphis 3, it's a real story. It's right. like... You would think that, that they'd be able to... It's like, oh my gosh, we, here we are. We've got the story of the West Memphis Three. We've signed Adam McGoyan. Oh my gosh, we're there, right? Like, like let's make, like, let's just nail this. And we've got Reese Witherspoon, Colin Firth. Like, that's just, and it just... Pfft. 
because <laughs> because they didn't because they didn't hire the um, the Adam McGoin of 1997. Yeah. They hired the Adam McGoin of, of 2013, yeah. who directed you know Where the Truth Lies and a bunch of other stuff. It's just terrible. Well, and you also have this it's script. Very disappointing. It's also not a great script. It was written by uh, Paul Harris Boardman and Scott Derrickson, and it doesn't. It just doesn't do with the material what the what needs to be done with the material. And uh, I don't know. I didn't read the source material. There's a book that it's based on as well. I didn't read that. I'm not that familiar with it. But it just doesn't. So every once in a while, you get a little uh, weird little indie that somehow kind of works, even though it probably shouldn't. A Short History of Decay um, features Linda Lavin, who used to be a neighbor of mine. Might still be. Don't know. Haven't seen her in ages. Maybe she's just uh, kind of doing the hermit thing. But anyway, this is from ARC Entertainment, uh, also starring uh, Brian Greenberg. And uh, here's the deal. This is one of those nerdy kind of inside movies by a writer about a writer, where you're venting all of your, uh, your all your frustrations in the in the character and so forth. And anyway, the uh, the main character here is Brian Greenberg, who of course plays one of those struggling writers. And you know, yes, I get it. You're you're the, the, everybody's venting their stuff. Uh, and I, and normally I hate these movies. Like, oh great, a, you know, screenwriter movie about a screenwriter. No one's really. Oh, Sunset yeah. Boulevard. Yeah, exactly. But that's like the only one that really works. The most, of, most of these are most of these are kind of navel gazing indie filmmaker movies where I'm gonna I'm gonna put all of my frustrations into it. Like they're using the movie as their own personal little couch trip, and nobody really wants to watch their little navel gazing pity party, which is what Sundance is, right? It's just <laughs> navel gazing pity parties. That's all it is. How dare you? Uh, but somehow this actually isn't bad. It uh, it it sort of goes beyond all of that, and uh, I I. I found myself sort of uh, finding myself drawn into the characters despite all of the writer stuff and the screenwriter stuff and all that and uh, it's nice to see Linda Lavin show up in a movie for crying out loud along, along with Emmanuel Shariki and um, some other good cast members uh, what's particularly interesting about this is that one of the executive producers in case you miss it is Milos Forman now, I don't know how Milos Forman wound up being an executive producer. Milos Forman is not even a producer. I don't know how he wound up involved in this, but um, bravo for doing so and, and for helping us uh, help him get it out there because that's, uh, that's a cool little thing. Uh, the Secret Lives of Dorks. Uh, not nearly as funny as you would think it should be, but the fact that it has Jennifer Tilly in it, who isn't in enough movies at all these days, uh, makes up for a lot. She's but, on Family Guy. Yeah, she's on Family Guy. She's a voice on Family Guy. She's on Family Guy. She's a voice on Family Guy. She's on Family Guy. Uh, anyway, she's in this. Jim Belushi's in this because obviously he'll be in anything. Um, it, not, it's, you know, it, wants to be, it wants to be somewhere between Revenge of the Nerds and Napoleon Dynamite. That's kind of what it aspires to. Uh, kind of, sort of, a little bit gets in there. But I think, I think there's a better movie to be made on this. But, you know, if, if that's your genre, whatever, I'm not going to argue with you. And then my, I got. I don't know if this is my pick of the week, but boy, this is an awful lot of fun. Alan Partridge, yeah. did you watch this? You know, it's, it's, it's a very cult character and a very cult thing, but... Uh, well, are you yeah, familiar with fun. the series? You ever watched the series? I, I've seen... The series is a riot. Yeah. The series, series is funny. just a hoot. Um, uh, Steve Coogan, now that he has a little bit of uh, grease after doing uh, the, uh, the Stephen Frears thing, getting an Oscar nomination for the screenplay and all that stuff, he's like, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to the well. I'm going to dig up the Alan Partridge character that was so funny in the UK and which uh, not enough people have seen in the US, and I'm going to make a movie. And so Alan Partridge, the movie version, uh, is actually very, very funny. Uh, if you're not familiar with Alan Partridge, he is... Um, a talk show host who is more annoying, callow, and unscrupulous than any human being you'll probably ever meet in your life. He's just the worst human being in the world. And as a result, he's unbelievably funny. So a uh, feature, ver- feature film version of the character, very funny. They, have a lot, they obviously can do, go in a lot more directions, and, uh, and they do. And if you're a fan of the show, even if you're not a fan of the show, you don't need to be. You're, you're going to laugh yourself. Just absolutely delirious. It's very, very funny. Very dry, very witty. Uh, classic British comedy. Steve Coogan at his very, very best in the Blu-ray of Alan Partridge from Magnolia. A few extras on here. A little making a featurette and a behind-the-scenes thing. And uh, not much else, but doesn't really need to be. That's about it. Um, Mark, let's go into... Uh, sh- 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 You're sh- not sh- even prepared to do this show. Well, I'm trying to figure... We got How much time? We got like five minutes left, and I'm looking here. You know what? I, this was left over from last week, so... Um, here, here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow through the World War II stuff, and I don't know if we show. can get through the PBS. There's, there's a ton oh, I can. You know I can. Okay. Good, not right. good. Good, not so good. There, I just got through. So the the World War there's a bunch of World War II stuff, which is relevant because it's the hundredth anniversary of World War One. I. I don't know what that means, but we got a bunch of interesting World War II titles here that uh, I want to put a plug in for. Uh, from the Athena line of Acorn, which is their educational line, is an absolutely extraordinary documentary that I have obviously very personal connection to, which is the rise of the Nazi Party. Uh, my mother, of course, for those who listened to the show for a long time, grew up in Germany, and uh, I heard firsthand all about the rise of the Nazi Party. So I, I know a good deal firsthand about how all this stuff transpired, and this is one of the best documentaries I've ever seen about the subject. Absolutely first rate. Uh, of course, uh, the Athena line caters to uh, educational programming and, uh, and, and schools and so forth. So it comes with a viewer's guide and all kinds of additional supplementary materials for educational purposes. Uh, there are 10 episodes here, a total of about six hours, and uh, it's like maybe five, five and a half hours, but it's, uh, it's first rate. It absolutely takes you through the, the evolution, because people wonder, how could, this pos how could any country have handed them the reins over to these lunatics? And you, you realize that it was a, that it was a, a calculated uh, process on their part and rather nefarious and yet completely and in many respects legitimate and, and democratic how they pulled this off initially. Uh, it's just the circumstances were right and any country could be, could be subject to that. Uh, then there's also Unsolved Mysteries of the Second World War from uh, Eagle Rock Entertainment. And uh, this gets a little bit sensationalistic, but uh, these actually are legitimate mysteries. And uh, it, it, it addresses them in that kind of in search of way, you know, the Leonard Nimoy series in search of. It kind of feels a little bit like that. Da, 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 yeah. Da, da, da. yeah. I mean, for example, a lot of people are always talking about, you know, did FDR know that they were going to attack, attack Pearl Harbor? Well, now there's a question, did Churchill know? Which there appears to be some evidence about. Uh, so anyway, a lot of interesting stuff, you know, the Nazi um, uh, nuclear program and stuff like that. And then similar, uh, although a little bit more legit, is Secrets of the Third Reich from the uh, Smithsonian Channel, um, which uh, delves into some of the same stuff, but these are, uh, these are a little more specific incidents. Um, like the most interesting one here is the Ghosts of U-513, which is this one particular U-boat, and it's really quite a remarkable story. Um, and then uh, there's also uh, one on here on, on uh, General Erwin Rommel, who I'm obsessed with because Patton read his book and called General him a magnificent... I read your book, you magnificent bastard. And then lastly, from Synodyme, is Hitler and the Nazis, Reign of Terror, Hitler's Pursuit of Global Domination. Uh, nothing particularly new here. This is kind of a rehash of stuff we've all seen dozens of times, but compressed into one movie. And uh, certainly not on par with the rise of the Nazi party, but a nice compliment to it if you are in a particularly dark mood and you want to sort of really, really make yourself just feel miserable about how horrible the, uh, the world was uh, not even a century ago. Uh, this really kind of goes through all the major historical beats. So those four titles will, uh, will make for a very, very happy summertime. Uh, Wade, do you want to see how fast I can do this? Do it. Ireland's Wild River, a journey down the Shannon River. From PBS, it's very pretty. Okay. Super Skyscrapers from PBS. It's all about the One World Trade Center and uh, what they call pretty much like vertical cities and how they're built and all the complex uh, problems in terms yes. of uh, geography and uh, construction Absolutely. and push the limits of engineering. Right on. If you like skyscrapers, good stuff. The Diary of Dr. Livingstone. Dr. Livingstone was a man. He was an adventurer, 19th century. I skipped through this. I know you do. I, kn <laughs> I know you did. You oh. didn't even pay oh. attention to what I'm saying. Okay. It's all fine. Right. Uh, Ken Burns gives us uh, the address, which is um, an interesting take on the Gettysburg Address, where um, each year the 50 students of Greenwood School are asked to uh, memorize the Gettysburg Address. And uh, so we'll see how they uh, make out. That's, that's insane. Now, these are kids between 11 and 17. That's so insane. I wouldn't do that. Only Kevin Burns could come up with an idea like that and pull it off, because obviously he gives you a sense of yeah. why the address is important. So it's not just memorizing it for the sake of memorizing. It's memorizing it to understand what it means and how important it was at the time. I could, see Ken, I, could see Ken, I could see Ken Burns memorizing it himself. Anyway. <laughs> All right. And then also from PBS. We've got a, a whole bunch of PBS stuff here. Uh, Snow Monkeys, narrated by Liam Neeson's. 
who we've been talking a lot about today, uh, is all about snow monkeys. And snow monkeys are creepy looking. They live in Japan, but you know what? It's, uh, this is on Blu-ray, and it's pretty, it's pretty fantastic. That was the shortest review you've done in the 15 years you've been doing this Thank show. Thank you. My Bionic Pet is all about the stuff that people are doing to facilitate their animals being able to live normal lives, all the creepy uh, prosthetics and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, I, you know, I got through about five minutes of this, and I was like, it looks like the little dog in Pig, uh, Babe Pig in the City who has the little chariot thing because he can't use his legs, and I, I'm going to get sad. So I didn't want to get sad. Uh, TB, The Silent Killer... An unforgettable portrait of lives forever changed by tuberculosis is worth having out there. You don't need to watch the whole thing. You just need to watch enough to realize that tuberculosis is still a problem, and it's still out there, and it's still killing people. Uh, Inside Animal Minds it gets a little silly. There are three episodes of Nova on this one, uh, which sort of try to psychoanalyze animals, and I, 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 I'm not buying it. I usually think Nova is really on board with some interesting science, but this I'm like, I don't know, not going there with you. As a frontline uh, documentary, Secrets of the Vatican, Inside the End of the Benedict Papacy and Pope Francis's Battle to Set the Church on a New Path. Uh, this would normally be National Enquirer type stuff, but really interesting. Frontline, of course, doesn't, doesn't speculate. They really, really get into the... They, they do their research, and they have uh, uh, unbelievable resources. And this is very interesting. Uh, I, I would suspect that... Um, some of this is is fairly speculative, but uh, wow, they really do document an awful lot of this. And this is uh, this is it's it's really good stuff. So if it even remotely interests you, it's only ninety minutes long. Um, very very interesting journalistic work there. Uh, Touching the Wild, uh, an episode of Nature, uh, which is all, uh, uh, all about the mule deer of Dead Man Gulch. Uh, utterly and completely uninteresting subject, but it's nicely photographed. So I guess that counts for something. The Pioneers of Television series uh, reaches season four with uh, Benjamin Bratt narrates this with uh, actually a much less interesting segment of television in this one. Uh, the four episodes here is Stand Up to Sitcom, uh, Doctors and Nurses, Breaking Barriers, and Acting Funny. Uh, Breaking Barriers is more interesting because it's all about you know people of color and, and landmark roles and in court you know like George Takei obviously and Margaret Cho and your favorite Desi Arnaz, Bill Cosby. So uh, that, that's a little bit more interesting. Stand up the sitcom, well, big deal. You know, there was that moment when suddenly every sitcom had to be a, a stand-up actor who was moving, whether it was Roseanne, or moving from you know, stand-up to sitcom, whether it was Roseanne, Seinfeld, you name it. Uh, that's far less interesting. Acting funny, um, doctors and nurses, kind of, you know, so it's, it's like they're just trying to stretch this series out a little bit. But if you've caught the first four episodes, the first four seasons, you'll be fine. And then the big mama here is a uh, PBS 50th anniversary edition of The Kennedy's Triumph and Tragedy. Uh, two, v two DVDs plus a booklet and a whole bunch of uh, Kennedy memorabilia uh, to obviously just perpetuate this, uh, this mystique. The, um, and this, of course, is not a 50th anniversary of the documentary in question. This is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Kennedy. And this is a two-part documentary that uh, goes into all of the details and the history of the, of the family. It is very good. It is very thorough. But it still feels like they're doing it just because it's something that they need to do. It's not like, oh, well, look, there's a 50th anniversary of the assassination. Let's make a documentary. It's not like somebody said, I think there's really new material here. There isn't a whole lot of new material. It sort of feels like everything that I've seen done a million other times. So while I respect PBS endlessly, I don't feel like this thing really paved a lot of new territory. It's... It is what it is. And now as we close the show, I assume you are going to go down for a true detective marathon. I, you know what? I actually am. I are kid you? you I, yeah, of course. Seriously? I kid you not. I, you know what? I, for some reason, you know, you know I've, I, I watch shows on Blu-ray. Yes. I, or DVD. And I don't really binge. I'm not a binger. Yeah. Because I have a life. Yeah. This one? Mm-hmm. Back up the popcorn. All I'm right. binging, baby. Well, me, I am going to go out and pick up some amazing Middle Eastern food at Carnival because I have a little girl who really likes hummus. Now, Carnival is famous because yes. that was the restaurant, I and mean, it's infamous, I guess, or famous for a sad reason. That was the restaurant that catered Patrick Swayze's uh, memorial service. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, because I think mm. he lived around here or something like that. Well, I love their hummus. I love their Lebna. If you don't know what that is, look it up. It's pretty great. And, uh, and I have a little girl who loves hummus, so I'm going to take her some hummus this evening. We'll see you guys next week.